well. Thanks very much. Um, whoops. Okay, let me get my cursor in the right place. Okay, so hopefully you can all see my slides. If I, you ever stop seeing them, let me know. Um, so I wanted to begin by thanking the organizers for creating and maintaining such a nice sense of community among our number theory community. Um, so especially in such a difficult time when people are feeling so isolated. Um, so I know that running such a seminar isn't easy, especially you know waking up at ridiculous hours like Alina in Sydney where it's one in the morning, and it'll be two in the morning by the end. Um, and just the fact that they're showing up at the talks, they're awake, they're paying attention, they're asking questions, they're leaving their video on. Um, you know, it's, it's really a tremendous service they're doing to the community. Uh, you know, I mean, tracking down elusive potential speakers who won't commit. Um, so I, I wanted to actually, one reason I'm saying this is I want to talk more about community later, but um, maybe to illustrate what sort of things these poor organizers had to deal with, I wanted to start by telling you, um, what happened in my case, so I gave him such a hard time. So over a year ago, Mike Bennett asked me to speak in the seminar. And as you know, as I kept putting this off, and each time he got back to me, I had like a some sort of really crazy excuse. So, you know, that got crazier and crazier as time went on. So I started out, you know, I'm preparing a different talk. I want to wait till I give that before thinking about giving another talk, I'll get back to you. And usually I say I'll get back to someone I do it, but this time I must have been so ambivalent about it. I, you know, I didn't get back and Mike would contact me again. And I'd say, well, you know, I really should go to some more of the seminars, see what they're like before I decide. Or, you know, I've been thinking about good ways for the community to make use of the existing technology. I'm not convinced I've yet figured out the right way to do it. I want to see how ANTS turns out and whether it's a good model for how to do online seminars and conferences. Um, but what I replied in December of 2020 was probably the strangest of all. So um, I'll actually read it to you. I'll say, I, so I wrote to Mike, I'll probably eventually accept the invitation, but I'd like to wait until after January 20th to decide. To be perfectly honest, I'm worried there's gonna be a civil war. I'd like to wait until Biden is safely inaugurated and it's hard for me to plan anything before that. Some part of me is thinking it's not a, just not a good use of my time to prepare a talk if the world is going to end before I give it. Um, so on January 6th, I was probably the only one whose reaction was, yes, now the number three web seminar organizers won't think that I'm totally crazy. So, um, but maybe I'll add that I think that, um, you know, the problem, well, so there are technological issues that make virtual talks difficult. Um, so, for example, I tend to feed off the audience, and if I have no idea what, whether they're even there, um, you know, that's really hard. And also, my internet connection isn't very good. So, I have this, this 100 foot Ethernet cable because I didn't trust my Wi Fi, and I'm doing the slides on my, on my television. So, if you look at me, glance to the side, I am, in fact, watching TV, but I'm watching my slides on TV. Um, but, and I also think that in some sense, online seminars capture all the bad things about math seminars and not a lot of the good things, like, you know, especially the free food, which I think is the, you know, is what attracts a lot of people. But, you know, also the conversations before and afterwards, which I think are really the, the most value in a seminar. So I think we want to, you know, rethink some of that and figure out what the best ways to do this are, because there are also a lot of really good things about the ability to, you know, to have an international audience and people can see speakers they never would have uh, you know, otherwise seen or heard. Um, so, well, you know, so in an effort to get out of giving the talk, I told Mike I was interested in giving maybe a more non-traditional talk, but I completely understood if that doesn't fit in with what they're looking for. Um, but he was very encouraging despite all my efforts, you know, where I'm going to be giving a talk. So let's get started. Um, so I'm going to take you on a quest to find cryptographically useful multilinear maps. Um, but what I'm also going to do, and I'm going to maybe fit it in a little bit during that, but, but maybe more at the end of the talk, I wanted to share some of what I've learned in my adventures as a mathematician and as a cryptographer and trying to be both at the same time. Um, and maybe another way to say that is things I wish that someone had told me sooner. Um, so in other words, I've made a lot of mistakes. I don't want you to make the same mistakes. So um, I'm going to maybe give a little bit of advice. Okay, so the quest to find cryptographically useful multilinear maps. So it begins, who's our cast of characters? Well, Alice, Bob, and a finite cyclic group. 
Um, so I'm going to start with something that many of you, I think most of you probably already know, Diffie-Hellman key agreement. So G is our finite cyclic group, um, and little g is a generator. And most partly I'm doing this to establish some terminology. Um, so Bob and I want to create a shared secret key that we're then going to use to encrypt and decrypt messages. Um, but we haven't met in advance and so, to exchange anything, so we have to somehow do this publicly through an insecure channel. So I choose my secret little a, Bob chooses his secret little b. Um, I take my element of my, my, my generator for my cyclic group, I raise it to the power a, Bob raises his to the power b, and we either send it to each other through the insecure channel, or we just broadcast it. So I might you know, broadcast it on the radio or publish it in the newspaper or whatever. And then we now share um, a common secret namely g to the power a b, which I can compute because everybody knows g to the b and I raise it to my secret power and Bob does the symmetric thing. Um, so we share that and why can't the adversary compute g to the a b? So this is establishing terminology. So the adversary we're gonna call the Jabberwock. Um, the Jabberwock cannot compute g to the a b as long as the Diffie-Hellman problem is hard. The Diffie-Hellman problem states find g to the a, b, given g, g to the a, and g to the b for random unknown a and b. So in other words, so why is this secure, such you know, Diffie-Hellman key agreement? Well, it's just a total, you know, it's secure if the Diffie-Hellman problem is hard, but that's just a tautology. It says it's secure if it's secure, but that's, that's what we have. Um, so you want to use a group in which you believe the Diffie-Hellman problem is hard. Okay, so now there's the question, what if three people or three parties want to create a shared secret and they want to do this with just one round of broadcast? They don't want to have a lot of interaction. Can this be done? So this was an open problem for a while and um, it was solved by Antoine Zhu in um, the year two a paper in the year 2000. So three parties want to share, create a shared secret, what can they do? So I choose my secret little a, Bob chooses little b, the Cheshire cat chooses little c, and we broadcast g to the a, g to the b, g to the c respectively. Those are all now public. Okay, so what, what can we do at this part, at this stage? Well, so now we make use of elliptic curves and pairings on elliptic curves, like they pairings on elliptic curves. So um, suppose that we have a pairing or a bilinear map um, from G cross, so you have a map from G cross G to our target group, I'll call it G sub T, T for target. Um, so what properties do we want this map to have? We want it to be efficiently computable and we want it to have this bilinearity property, which says that if you input G to the A and G to the B, that's the same as if you pair G and G and took the output and raised it to the power a b for all integers a and b. Okay, so we want, so suppose we had such a thing and think in terms of something like a they pairing on, a, on the uh, points on elliptic curve. So then I claim that three of us um, after this one broadcast all share um, what happens when you pair g with g, take the output and raise it to the power a b c. And the reason I can compute that is I take the two public broadcasts that I see from Bob and the Cheshire Cat, I input them, I take the output and I raise it to my secret. And Bob does the symmetric thing and the Cheshire Cat does the symmetric thing and we all can, can compute the shared secret. And then the question is, why can't you figure out the secret? Why can't the Jabberwock figure out the secret? And the answer is, well, the Jabberwock can't compute this shared supposed secret if what we'll call the bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem is hard. And the bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem says find the secret, find the shared um, quantity given the public information. So given G, G to the A, G to the B, and G to the C for random unknown integers A, B, and C between um, one and the order of the group G. Um, so again, the security is just a tautology. Um, so this problem has been created to make this system secure. Okay, so Antoine Zhu came up with this method um, for one round three-party key agreement. In the year 2000, he said, well, for the group G, 
you want to use a cyclic subgroup of the group of points on a elliptic curve over a finite field, finite field of sufficiently large size. And this bilinear map is going to come in a suitable way from a Vey pairing on the elliptic curve, or what photographers call the Tate pairing or Tate um, Lichtenbaum pairing. Um, and so you might have to modify the Vey pairing because um, you know to get the to get something suitable. But I'll, I'll leave that aside for the moment. And there are actually other pairings that one can use. Um, so maybe I'll say that the success of pairings in cryptography, I would say, came about through curiosity, good communication between mathematicians and computer scientists, and being open to opportunities. So the idea that, hey, you can use the Vey pairing and do this, this really cool thing that solves a problem in cryptography, I think, had to do with Antoine being you know, curious and open to opportunities. Now, in fact, the Vey pairing had been introduced into cryptography 10 years earlier. And it was introduced in a way that showed that there was a destructive aspect to it. So this is um, what I'll call the MOV attack because it's named after Menezes, Okamoto, and Vanstone. Um, so in 1991, um, they showed the destructive power. And so just to, um, again for terminology, so G and G sub T from now on are cyclic groups of the same prime order. Um, and we're going to do it in such a way that if you um, input G and G, the output is an element we know of G sub T. I want it to be a generator, which since our, we have a cyclic group of prime order, just means it's not, it's not the identity element in the group. Now, of course, if it were the identity element in the group, if E of G comma G were equal to one, then remember this bilinearity property, it would say that no matter what you input, you input g to the a, g to the b, you know, you're, you're still going to get one. Um, so you'd have a pretty trivial um, map. And so you'd be sharing, you know, your, your secret sharing algorithm uh, protocol would always be giving you one, and that's not giving you much of a secret. So bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem would not be a hard problem in that case. It would be a trivial problem. So you want this I'll call the non-degeneracy property. So you get a generator of the group. You don't get the identity element. OK, so this MOV attack um, was used to show that the discrete log problem could be easy in certain cases. So we'll call the discrete log problem is that given your generator G and G to the A, find A, so find the exponent. Um, so Menezes, Okamoto, and Vanstone showed that if your pairing is sufficiently computable and non-degenerate, and if the discrete log problem is easy in the target group, then the discrete log problem is easy in the group G that you started with, and therefore the Diffie-Hellman problem would be easy. Um, so why is that? Um, so how do we solve the discrete log problem in G if we um, know how to do it in G sub T? How do we use the pairing? Well, we compute two, two things. We input G and G and take the pairing and see what we get, the E of G comma G, and we pair G with G to the A. Um, well, when we pair G with G to the A, that's the same as pairing G with G, taking the output and raising it to the A. Um, and, but we know how to solve the discrete log problem in G sub T. So we can just now, once we do compute this, um, we can solve the discrete log problem solve for A, and that tells us A, and that solves the discrete log problem in the group G, which was our goal. So if the discrete log problem is easy over in G sub T, um, and we have an efficiently computable non-degenerate pairing, then the discrete log problem is easy in G. Um, and what that tells you, what that told people at the time, um, is that certain elliptic curves are not safe for elliptic curve cryptography because um, they have efficiently computable Vey pairings that take values in the multiplicative group of a finite field in which the discrete log problem um, is too easy. So that said, there are certain weak elliptic curves for elliptic curve cryptography. Um, so this showed that pairings can be destructive in cryptography, and it took a decade to realize that they can actually be used constructively, and that was Antoine Zhu. Um, in the year 2000, as I mentioned. Um, so communication is important. I like to think that maybe if there'd been better communication between computer scientists and mathematicians, maybe um, this could have been solved sooner. Maybe we would have seen the constructive 
aspects appearing sooner. So I'll get back to this, um, this topic later about communication. Um, and I do want to mention that um, at the same time as Antoine Zhu was doing three-party key agreement, Sakai Ogishi and Kasahara came up with a method to do something called identity-based key agreement with no interaction, which is a really cool application of pairings on elliptic curves. Um, and just, um, I think, just for lack of time, I won't show it. I, it's, sometimes I show it, it's just two slides, but um, I'll, maybe I'll leave that as an exercise or a go and, um, and look up their, their, very, their, their paper. It's a very, very elegant solution to this problem. Um, okay, so we had two-party key agreement. We have three-party key agreement. What about four-party key agreement? So if four parties want to establish a shared secret with one round of broadcasts. Um, well, so this is an open question. Um, well, so what happens if you just try to generalize Antoine Ju's solution? So, um, so there's a paper of Dan Bonet and myself from 2003, um, in which we tried to, well, basically we were trying to do the same thing I'm trying to do in this talk, which is to publicize the idea of publicize this problem, this open question, so that someone could hopefully come up with a solution. So we said, look, if you try to do what Antoine's doing, um, you want to generalize a pairing. So you want to have an efficiently computable map, G cross G cross G and so on, let's say n times, mapping to our target group G sub T. So G, G sub T, cyclic groups of the same prime order, um, with efficiently computable group operations and inverses, um, and we want to have now this multilinearity property. So these are the multilinear maps that I mentioned um, in the title of the talk. So here, if you input um, g to the a1 up to g to the um, a sub n, that should be the same as inputting g multiple times, taking the output and raising it to the product um, a1 up to a sub n for all integers um, a sub i. Okay, so if you have such a thing, then I claim you can do one round multi-party key agreement. So we all have, we all choose our individual secrets. We don't tell anybody else. We broadcast, um, you know, we take the generator for our cyclic group and raise it to our secret, broadcast that. Um, so now we have, remember we had N inputs to our map and we have it now N plus one parties and I claim the n plus one parties share this quantity. And the way I compute this quantity is I take all the broadcasts that I see, which are all public, and so I have access to them. Um, I plug them into my multilinear map. I have my n inputs. I take the output and I raise it to my secret. So just the same as we did as Antoine Ju's solution um, to three-party key agreement. And everybody else does the same thing. They take the broadcast that they see, they input them, they take the output, and they raise it to their secret. And because of the multilinearity property, we all get the same value. And that's you know, a fine solution, except then the question becomes, do we have such maps? Um, well, I should say, OK, what about security? Should it be the most important thing, cryptography is security. Um, so the adversary, the Jabberwock, can't compute the shared value if the multilinear Diffie-Hellman problem is hard, where, of course, the multilinear Diffie-Hellman problem says find the shared secret given all the public inputs for random unknown um, values a1 up through a sub n minus 1 integers. Um, OK, so that was the multilinear Diffie-Hellman problem, just reminding you of it at the top of this slide. Um, and I'll just point out, so when n equals 1, this just reduces to the regular old multilinear Diffie-Hellman problem is the regular old Diffie-Hellman problem, where the map E is just the identity map on the group G. So you have your one input, your target group is the group G, this is the identity map. It should look a lot like the Diffie-Hellman problem. Um, when n equals 2, the multilinear, multilinear Diffie-Hellman problem is just the bilinear Diffie-Hellman problem. That's, that should be easy to see. Okay. Um, so in the same paper, so this paper had a constructive side and a, sort of a destructive side, or it had an optimistic and a pessimistic side. Um, so the optimistic side was that, well, so if you had these nice multilinear maps, you can do all sorts of nice things. As I said, 
Um, you can do one round multi-party key agreement, but you could also do these other nice things that cryptographers um, were, were interested in. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll point out that after that other people showed, um, people were working on something called um, code obfuscation or really more specifically indistinguishability obfuscation. And cryptographic multilinear maps are closely connected to that. So if you had cryptographic multilinear maps, you could do code obfuscation. And in, that in turn has a lot of applications to a lot of different kinds of, of encryption and is in some sense a holy grail of cryptographers. Um, okay, so the pessimistic side. So I, I sometimes think that, you know, computer scientists in collaborations between um, computer scientists and mathematicians in cryptography, I think the computer scientists are often the optimists and the um, mathematicians are the pessimists. Um, so we also proved in this paper that if you impose enough natural properties on the multilinear maps, then essentially the only possibilities you can have are the ones you already know, namely in the case n equals one with the identity map and pairings on abelian varieties when um, in, with the case n equals two. And so getting more than three parties to share a secret, um, so there's the question, what do we mean by these natural properties? So the philosophy there is, if a computer is going to be able to do this, you expect that you're gonna be dealing with polynomials. If you're dealing with polynomials, you're doing algebraic geometry. And if you're doing algebraic geometry, well, you might expect that if you're doing something like these maps, um, you might have, you know, a system of Galois equivariant multilinear mod L maps for infinitely many primes L. It somehow seemed like a natural thing, which is what happens, of course, with something like the Ve pairing. So at the time we did this, you know, there was just the Ve pairing. It had all these very natural properties that we know that the Ve pairing on elliptic curves and abelian varieties have. And we thought, well, you know, those seem like very natural properties. If you're going to come up with a mathematical solution, it's probably going to have these natural properties. Um, but so what are the grounds for optimism after that? Well, so fortunately, and many of the pairings that people came up with later to using pairing-based cryptography are actually not very natural to a mathematician, and they wouldn't satisfy these natural properties that we had in the theorem. Um, and another ground for optimism is that, um, so, so cryptographers can be extremely clever and come up with really clever solutions to things. So in, um, in 2013, Gard, Gentry, and Halevi constructed what they called candidate multilinear maps, and I might think of it more as approximate multilinear maps, um, using lattices that come from ideals in rings of integers and number fields. Um, and so there are these sort of things that come, that, that sort of serve the same purpose as the multilinear maps that Dan and I were envisioning um, without really, you know, exactly satisfying the definition that we gave, but, you know, they, they in some ways work well to accomplish the applications that people were interested in. Um, so, well, so the things that people proposed to use to solve some of these problems were then attacked and would, you know, would turn out to be weak, and people would then come up with new constructions, there'd be new attacks. Um, I think, I believe it's still the case that all the constructions are still very inefficient and therefore not really practical yet. Um, so far, I believe they're insecure when applied to multi-party key agreement and they require a trusted third party. Um, and I'll, I'll mention here that Dan Bonet, Ted Chinberg, and Akshay Venkatesh and I have a project in which we're working on constructing cryptographically useful multilinear maps. And I think other people are also doing that. And I also wanted to, to publicize this in case other people have ideas. I was thinking also in terms of things like topology, there may be you know, places outside of algebraic geometry that one should look. Um, but going back into my mathematician pessimist, you know, putting my mathematician pessimist hat on, um, well, so let's ask the question, how secure is pairing-based cryptography? Well, so many new crypto systems are, are being created using pairings and elliptic curves. I think if you Google, um, was it pairing-based crypto lounge or something like that, you get, um, I, I, I don't think it's still being maintained, but there are like hundreds of papers about pairing-based cryptography. People keep coming up with these new, really nifty, clever um, constructions whose security is often based on the presumed difficulty 
of a problem in number theory that's often a new problem that's just been created in order to get this new crypto system to be secure. Um, and to give you some examples of the types of problems, and I don't really want you to necessarily look at these problems or necessarily try to solve these problems, um, but to give you, the, in, you know, an example of the sorts of things people are doing is you get these rather complicated problems like K bilinear Diffie-Hellman exponent problem. So given a whole bunch of stuff, you make a whole bunch of stuff public, is it still hard to compute this other thing? Or the Diffie-Hellman inversion problem, if you have a multilinear map, um, can you find the appropriate thing? Um, and then there's something like the decisional K bilinear Diffie-Hellman exponent problem. And certain cryptographers have told me, stop talking about this this way. People will think these things are insecure. You're making fun of our problems. You know, we don't want our problems to be made fun of. But really, I think what the point I want to make here, um, the reason I put decisional in red, so a decisional problem is a problem um, with, with a yes or no answer. Um, and whenever I see decisional and pairings, so a, you know, a, a pairing-based solution to a cryptography problem where the security is based on a decisional problem, that's for me a red flag. And the reason is the following. Um, so there's a well-known problem in, um, in cryptography called, you know, I mentioned the Diffie-Hellman problem, there's also the decisional version of that problem. So the decisional version says, um, given G, G to the A, G to the B, and H, all in my group G, decide if H equals G to the AB. So rather than finding G to the AB, decide whether a given random element in G is in fact G to the AB. And um, it was known that decisional Diffie-Hellman is easy with pairings. I think this was pointed out to me by Gerhard Frey around the same time as the MOV, or maybe even a little bit before that. He said, hey, you know, pairings are dangerous in cryptography um, because of this solution. So how would you solve decisional Diffie-Hellman with pairings? Well, you pair G to the A and G to the B, and separately you pair G and H, and you compare them. And I claim if they're equal, um, then, you, then you should output yes, and if they're not equal, you should output no. And so why is that? Well, when you pair G to the A and G to the B, and use the bilinearity property, you see you get E of um, GG to the AB, but that's the same by the bilinearity property as what happens when you input G and G to the AB. So, um, and it follows that H equals G to the AB if and only if E of, uh, if and only if this equals E of G comma H. So if, in other words, if and only if this equals E of G comma H, um, and so that justifies the statement. So in other words, if you see a dis, you know, decisional Diffie-Hellman problem is easy if you have a pairing. And for me, that's, you know, that, that I always, you know, my ears perk up when I, when somebody says, here's a decision, here's a, a solution um, to some interesting cryptography problem. It uses pairings, but it's based on a decisional problem. Oh, Alice, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but there's a question from uh, from Igor Vigman in the in the chat. Igor, would you like to uh, unmute and ask? Yes. Uh, so as I understood, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, as I understood, uh, it is uh, so you are trying to design a protocol of one round exchange of uh, some secret and some shared information. And obviously for N plus one players uh, and and round the uh, protocol is trivial by just first exchanging pairs, then increase by round by, by one each round. My question is whether or not it's trivial to do it uh, in two rounds for arbitrary many players. Uh, two rounds for arbitrary many players. You know, off the top of my head at eight in the morning at the, at the talk, I, I'd have, I'm not sure. I have to think that about it. Because for every problem uh, somebody cannot solve, there is an easier problem somebody cannot solve. Uh, <laughs> and that might be the case here. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah. Now, I think probably some of the uh, computer scientists, cryptographers who thought of this could give you the answer off the top of their heads. Um, but yeah, I'd have to think about that later. So I, I think I'll put that aside. Well, in fact, uh, somebody actually uh, responded to this question. Uh, Daniel Bernstein, uh, that uh, two round is known. Yeah, Dan or and or Tanya, ah, and gives a reference. Yes. 
So, okay. So yeah. in fact, uh, in this case, there is not an easier problem that you cannot solve. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, so we had the, luckily we had the right people in the audience who could. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks Dan and or Tanya. Great, yeah, and thanks for the question. Okay, um, so one thing, so one reason I'm giving this talk is that I want number theorists to be, um, well, so let me maybe, um, Looking at this slide, for a crypto system whose security is based on the presumed difficulty of a number theory problem, you know, we would have a lot of more confidence, I think, in the security if the right people actually looked at the question. Um, so we don't want to be in a situation where security relies on the assumption that the right mathematicians haven't looked at the problem. Um, so at some point, number, the number theory community should be looking at these so-called hard problems on which these systems rely, because a lot of them are number theory problems. And preferably before these crypto systems are deployed in the real world, for example, to secure our bank accounts or run medical devices or um, you know, th things on which our lives might depend. Um, so usually, um, so I've been uh, running a number of conferences to, designed to bring computer scientists and mathematicians together to try to solve cryptography problems. And usually my goal is to encourage them to work together peaceably. And my advice is, my advice to mathematicians is immerse yourself in the cryptographic community. So especially read cryptography papers, go to cryptography conferences and talk to cryptographers. But you know, the more I do this, the more I realize that there's something else that I really should be keeping in mind and maybe I'll give as a reminder that cryptographic security is essentially an adversarial situation. So if the attackers and the people who are building the systems are too close, um, there can maybe be less incentive to seriously attack something, either because you don't want to attack your friends, or because there's peer pressure not to attack somebody else's baby, or maybe you can't even get it published because of you know, friends of the person whose baby it is who doesn't want their system attacked. So you might actually want to have separate venues for maybe mathematicians and computer scientists or attacks and, um, and you know, the building systems because you know, there, there are different pressures involved there that, that may be important to keep in mind. Um, but you know, I, I do worry that some of what's being done and some of what's being built is only secure because the right people haven't looked at it. And so that's one reason I wanted to advertise in this community, the number theory community, um, that there's all this stuff going on out there where people are saying this is secure. And then maybe after 10 years they say, well, nobody's broken it yet. And I always you know, raise my hand and say, but that's because the right people haven't looked at it. Have you sent it to so-and-so? Have you tried this or that? Um, so, um, so what I actually, so one thing I'd like to do for the remainder of the talk is um, ask the community to maybe take, use the pandemic as an opportunity. Um, so an opportunity to maybe reevaluate our priorities, improve what needs to be changed, and probably also change some of the incentives. Um, so something I wrote, so last year I was asked to give a, a keynote talk at Eurocrypt. Um, which was supposed to be in Zagreb, although I ended up giving it on giving the talk online. But I also had was asked to write write up something. So what I wrote in February of 2020 for the article associated with the talk was um, one of the things I said was many of the impediments to making full use of mathematics to solve cryptographic questions are social rather than technical. Cultural differences between the fields can lead to obstacles and misunderstandings that delay the progress of science. And I said that in the talk, I plan to attempt to share some thoughts and ideas for how to move forward in constructive ways. I hope that these suggestions that I give would also have wider applicability maybe to our daily lives. Um, and that my more general goals come from a sense that we live in dangerous times. The communication between people is breaking down norms for social behavior are changing, the value systems on which we base our decisions and our lives are being called into question, and we sometimes wonder whether it makes sense to continue working as before when the problems of the world seem so weighty. Um, and so in an effort to act locally while thinking globally, what I plan to do in that talk and what I plan to do in this talk is to give some suggestions 
that I hope would not only help the cryptography and math communities to work together, but maybe be more useful generally in working with others and in communicating across cultures. So, um, so what I wanted to do was, you know, encourage us to maybe reset, think about where we should go from here. I know that the organizers of this seminar are thinking about, well, you know, there are a lot of good things about having online seminars. How can we keep those after the pandemic, you know, if there is an end to the pandemic, or what should we keep going? Do we want to continue to have such things? Um, but, and I also wanted to maybe give some advice in the talk, but it's really important, I thought, to point out, um, you know, as Lewis Carroll said about a different Alice, she generally gave herself very good advice, though she very seldom followed it. So I'm not claiming that I'm any good at following my own advice. Um, I make lots of mistakes and I'm hoping that what I learned from my own mistakes is gonna help, you know, hopefully some people in the audience to not make quite so many. So getting it right, what do I mean? Um, so this slide, what's going on in this slide? Um, well, so people remember stories. And so what I'm going to do is to tell you a few stories. And this slide is to remind me of a story. Um, so some of you may be old enough to remember, to, to recognize some of these things. Um, so I first learned about computers in the 1970s when I cross-registered for a course at MIT, where I learned Fortran using punch cards. So that's what you see on the left. This is for those of you who haven't seen these things, I should maybe point out this is very much not to scale, this slide. Um, but there's the, the punch, the, the machine is, is on the lower left, and I don't even remember anymore which where the cards went in, and then you punch them, and then they come out. Um, but after I took that course, I took Harvard's introductory computer course, and that's what this is reminding me on the right. Um, where, among other things, I learned to program the PDP-8 and the PDP-11 in machine language and assembly language. Um, and I still have my great PDP-11 programming card because I knew how useful that would be someday, um, which, of course, you know, this is, this is um, nonsense. You know, I've never used this. Um, you know, I, I guess I was wondering how much you could sell this for on eBay. I, have my, I still have my, my nifty... Um, PDP-11 programming card, and I actually looked it up, and somebody was asking five thousand dollars for their PDP-11 programming card. So the answer, you know, so the moral of the story is never throw anything out. Um, okay, but what? So did so was this course in the end totally useless for me? Well, no, because one thing I learned was not that I didn't want to be a computer scientist, and another thing was that I learned how computer scientists were being trained at the time. Um, so for example, some of the quizzes consisted of the following. We were told, write a short program in 10 minutes where you're allowed to make some large number of mistakes. I don't remember whether it was like seven or eight mistakes in like a 10 line program. And I thought this was totally unreasonable because for one thing, the way I would do this is I would sit down for 10 minutes, figure out the right way to do the program. And then I could very quickly code it up, you know, maybe in two minutes. But, you know, if you're doing the arithmetic, that's 12 minutes and they, you know, pencils down after 10 minutes and you get zero points if you do it that way. And, you know, I didn't like getting zero points, so I thought this was terribly unfair. And I also didn't see the point in writing a computer program with mistakes. You know, computers, if anything, is where things should be right. You know, if you're going to have a medical device that's in which your life depends, you know, the fact that it works most of the time, well, it, you know, I have very bad luck. I knew I was going to be the time that it didn't work. So, you know, a computer program, it seemed to me, should be 100% correct. It's not just, you know, let's feed in a bunch of values and if, you know, nine tenths of the time it works, we'll give the person an A. Um, and, you know, for the homework assignments, it worked the same way. You'd have to write some big program. Um, the other students would spend, you know, half an hour writing the program and 17 hours debugging. I could you know, sit, about, sit there, sit down, think for an hour, come up with the right way to do it, spend half an hour coding and much less time debugging, but that wasn't what we were, they were being trained to do. So there was a whole generation of computer programmers who in my view were being taught to not care if it's right as long as it's close enough. Um, so one reason I became a mathematician is that mathematicians care if it's right. Um, and 
Um, this is something I'm reminded of almost every day now. The um, University of California, anyone who's had any financial dealings with the University of California, even if you don't work there, if you gave a talk there and you had to give your social security number or your bank account information in order to get paid an honorarium by the University of California, your personal and banking information is now for sale on the dark web, thanks to a recent data breach. And my university directed us to a video in which the head of cybersecurity at UCSD said he had accumulated more than a decade of free credit monitoring because his own personal data had been breached so many times, mostly because he did a lot of work for the federal government. So if you think about that, if you stop and think about that, that's not so good. That's not how things should be. Um, and as I was preparing the talk, you know, there's there's more and more stuff going on. So there's, you know, the colonial pipeline, the reason some people couldn't um, fill their cars with gas on the East Coast. Um, so this article says, you know, actually there was an audit three years ago that found atrocious information management practices, a patchwork of poorly secured systems. And if you, I don't know if you can read the bottom of the slide, the author of the audit told the Associated Press um, in this, I, I quote here, I mean, an eighth grader could have hacked into that system. Um, and I'm reminded of this computer course that I took as an undergrad and the idea that fast and dirty is better than slow and careful. When I think of the issue of publishing in competitive conference proceedings versus publishing in journals, and this is, you know, in the past was a big difference between computer science and mathematics. So the math community I'm concerned has started to borrow this idea of deadlines and page limits from the computer science community. And I wanted to say that I'm not convinced that research that gets done under tight deadlines and page limits with short time windows for referees is better for society than research that's done carefully and correctly that referees have time to check with some back and forth between referees and authors. Um, so it's, I think it's important to get things right. And I think it's better for science and for the profession of published pa papers are polished and correct and the literature is reliable. And I'm concerned that we're moving away from that. And I think if you want people to trust scientists, the scientists had better be doing the right thing. Um, but I will say on the other hand, the math community does need to get its act together. So when the authors supply camera ready copy for an accepted paper and it takes three years to get the page proofs for it, you know, it's not clear why it should take three years to put something online when you have camera ready copy. Um, and I'm talking about the memoirs of the AMS, for example. So if we were to look for how should these problems be solved, you might say, well, the AMS should be thinking about this. This is a uh, you know, big solution. You know, can we get fast publication with correct, well-written papers? Can we have the best of, of all worlds? But I'm wondering whether the AMS is maybe getting too large to solve some of these problems. We might want to try some of them on a more local level, for example, in the community of number theorists. And I will say the journal Algebra and Number Theory does seem to be much faster. And I'm wondering if that would be a good model for how to do publishing right. Maybe people who know more about that can, um, can say more. And we also want to change the reward system. So this is going back to what I meant. Um, about incentives, change the reward system so good editi editing and refereeing are appropriately rewarded. rewarded. Um, so for example, maybe we should have awards for good referees so people could put this on their CV and say, I won uh, an award for you know, top 10 referees for you know, journal algebra and number theory or whatever. Um, and another way in which we shouldn't be necessarily be emulating the computer scientists, or maybe for that matter, scientists in general, is in the hype. So we want, you know, we, again, we, if we want people to trust us, we have to earn that trust. Um, so I served on a campus-wide committee whose, you know, one of whose points, or the, maybe the main point, was to ensure fairness in evaluating faculty across the campus. And I was amazed at the level of hype, and in some cases, actually downright dishonesty where bad behavior would get rewarded, people who do the right thing would be punished. So you need to change the incentives and incentivize people to be honest. And this is something funding agencies, I'm guessing there may be some people from funding agencies in the audience, and universities should think about and solve. But mathematicians, I think, have a useful role to play because we understand true and false and what constitutes proof and what doesn't. Um, so I'm also a great believer in using experts. So for example, so I, I think that I, I'm told there are some you know, students and postdocs in the audience, but I think this is also probably actually for everyone. 
Um, so send preprints to the experts for their feedback before making the public. If you have a question that you um, need to know the answer to and you've tried hard to solve it and can't, ask the experts. And if there's a problem that needs to be solved, and this was you know, part of the idea of having conferences to solve problems in cryptography, get the experts involved. Find out who the right people are who should be solving this. So I'm not saying people should believe the experts. So you should always verify things for yourself. I'm saying you should spend more time listening to people who know what they're talking about um, rather than people who don't. So maybe to give you a story, an example. Um, so a number of theorists I know created a crypto system that turned out to be weak. And I asked him whether he thought about running it past Don Coppersmith before publishing it. And this is many years ago. And he replied, well, why would I do that? He just would have broken it. Um, so I worry that the desire or the need to get a paper published is distorting some of our values. Um, and maybe on a lighter note, um, you know, someone recently wrote in Facebook that he didn't understand the meaning of a phrase in a paper that a certain mathematician had published many years ago. And I was going to reply, well, why don't you just ask him what he meant? Um, but rather than getting into a discussion about why, you know, about why he didn't do that, I decided it'd be more fun and more efficient to just mail, email the author myself and say, what did you mean by this phrase? And this led to a very delightful email exchange with this you know, famous mathematician. So my advice is be curious and open to opportunities. Um, you know, I think especially during the pandemic, just, you know, the idea of maybe we should be, you know, any, any good excuse to contact someone and see how they're doing during the pandemic. Um, is actually can be a good thing to do. But of course, do your homework first. Don't ask a question that you could have answered on your own. You don't want to waste anybody else's time. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll point out just because I think it's a timely thing. Um, you know, I often see people who have knowledge, expertise or experience who are passed over in favor of people with less knowledge, experience and expertise. You know, if you look at Facebook, you see people talking about all sorts of things they know nothing about. And I know I'm not the only one who finds it frustrating, you know, when people don't listen to me and they choose instead to listen to people with less experience or expertise. So, um, so communication, I want to emphasize the importance of listening. So if you're curious, you'll talk less, you'll listen more, um, you learn a lot more by listening than by talking. This is, you know, in some sense, one of the most important thing, pieces of advice I can give people nowadays. Um, so listen more. If you want to know something, ask questions, listen carefully to the answers. So be curious, um, listen to others, listen to different points of view. So maybe I'll tell another story. So one nice thing about cryptography is that you get to name crypto systems in memory of your cat. So here's my cat Kaylee. And um, if you have a cat whose last name ends with DH, obviously it's asking for a crypto system to be named after it. So Compact Efficient improves on Luke and improves on Dippy Hellman. That's what Kaylee stands for. And there's Kaylee. Um, now, I was surprised to learn that some uh, computers, some cryptographers refer to it as the dead cat crypto system. I'm sure no one here will ever do that. Um, it's also my most widely seen work since this episode of numbers in which uh, you can see Kaylee on the blackboard and the equations for the crypto system all around it. Um, I think that was uh, viewed by over 12 million people. Um, but so what's the story? So a computer scientist wanted to implement uh, the Cayley crypto system. And he claimed he was a really good person to do that, uh, that he was you know, the right expert. Um, so Cayley uses finite fields with Q to the six elements where Q is a large prime power. Ah, uh, thank you, Drew, <laughs> um, for the uh, putting the link in the chat. Um, so I asked him about his mathematical background, and he told me he had a very strong background in algebra and number three. But eventually he told me that the Cayley algorithm had to be wrong. And we talked for a while and we kept going in circles. And finally, I asked him, OK, the finite field with four elements, tell me what you know about that. And it became clear that he thought that the finite field with four elements was the same as the integers modulo of four. Um, he didn't realize the integers modulo of four is not a field. So one thing I want to say is clear communication is important, especially with people in a different field or a different culture. So if I ask, you know, what did I learn from this? What should I have done differently? Probably I should have listened more carefully. I shouldn't have tried to read his mind or assume that I knew what he meant when he said he had a certain type of background. 
um, rather than just going on about finite fields, assuming he, he understood. Um, I shouldn't have been annoyed with him. I'll get to a slide that says, be curious, not furious. I think this is maybe an appropriate um, time to mention that. Um, and also, he wasn't the person with the right expertise and probably shouldn't have been implementing Cayley. Um, but I probably should have been more curious and open to opportunities. Uh, here's my slide. So be curious and not furious, I think. Um, and I should give credit where credit is due. So um, there's a marvelous book by Dorothy Hellman and Martin Hellman, the same Hellman of Diffie Hellman, um, about how to solve all the problems of the world by being, well, actually, the, the phrase they use was get curious, not furious. Um, and that's actually a really useful piece of advice. So I credit, uh, you know, it's important to give credit in the right place. And this is uh, who I credit with that. Um, brilliant idea. And I suggest that everybody read their book about relationships. Um, so it, it solve, improve their marriage. It will bring about world peace. And uh, it's actually a very good book. OK, so in terms of communicating, um, after observing conflicts for a while, both inside the cryptology community and also in the number theory community and elsewhere, um, I realized that a lot of the conflicts that I had been seeing over the years come from failures of communication. So especially in thinking that you can read somebody else's mind. Um, and maybe I'll give one more story. So a number theorist was telling a number of people that he had found a mistake in a theorem in a certain number three book. So now all the people, all the people in the audience who wrote number three books are cringing because they don't know if I'm talking about their book. Um, and I asked, did you tell the author um, in case the author was compiling a rata? And he said, no, he wouldn't react well to my telling him about a mistake in his book. You know, people take that personally. And I replied that from what I knew of this author, I didn't think that would be the case. That I, but in any case, I thought he had a professional obligation to tell the author. You know, it's not his job to read minds. And if I remember correctly, he did eventually contact the author, and he told me that it did go okay. Um, that he, you know, he took it well. But even if the author had behaved unprofessionally, there's still a professional obligation to inform him. Okay, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to very briefly say, um, for the sake of the environment and to build community, I was wondering whether we should have, and this is maybe something we could discuss in the, in the Q&A, have fewer conferences and instead make better use of long-term programs. So I found a great sense of community in semester-long programs at research institutes. Um, and they can have week long workshops in them that would bring people who can't come for the whole semester. But I think it's a good way to build community, which I think is an important thing to do right now, given the state of the world that we live in. And I do want to get to this slide, which, um, you know, if I had to put together all the advice I've given people over the years that I wish they would remember, you know, if I look at what goes wrong, I can say, well, they didn't follow one of the things on this list. So, Mostly the thing to remember is two words, behave professionally. Ask yourself, is this professional? Is this ethical? Is this legal? Um, you know, like ghosting and bailing are not professional behavior. That's something to remember, uh, for example. Um, put in place good and transparent practices and policies and hold people accountable. So I'm a great believer in transparency and accountability. Train people in best ways to referee papers and hiring and promotion, admitting students and teaching. Um, and make the rules of the game clear. Don't change the rules in the middle of the game and ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to play the game and win. And this is, you know, an example would be in hiring where they're often the secret rules. There's an inner circle that knows the rules and they know which rules they can break and get away with and the inner circle has an advantage. So in hiring, um, they're the secret criteria and the real criteria for the job, you know, or, you know, and there's the one that you make public and they should be the same. Um, okay, and I'm definitely running out of time, so I'll just remind you that we're all in the same boat. It's a small world, we're all dependent on each other, and I really like pictures of boats. Um, and that, um, and so this phrasing is due to Shahed Sharif, again, giving credit where credit is due, that kindness is a superpower. So right now, I know there are a lot of people in our community suffering from the pandemic. So I've heard from, you know, students and postdocs and untenured faculty, and I know people with children have you know, been very hard hit. People at high risk for COVID because of age and medical reasons, given the stress everyone is under, 
um, it's, it's especially important to be kind. Um, and if I want any time for questions, I think I better stop there. So this is the time for you to ask me some questions. <laughs>